soldiers, sailors, and airmen. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. Welcome back to World War II TV. Joining me today for the first of two Normandy shows this week is Denis Renault. He is an archaeologist from Ottawa and is bringing us the incredible story of a small battlefield find and the history he literally and figuratively uncovered from it. It's based on this book that he kindly sent me a copy of called Harry's Bracelet. There is a link to purchase at the moment, but that's via his own website. He has run out of copies, but when we can tell you where else you can buy it, we will do that. So if you're watching this a few months down the line, there may be an, an additional link down there, but at the moment, there's only the one. As soon as we have another link, we will let you know. But in the meantime, we can still have a story there. So if you're new to the channel, by the way, welcome aboard. Please don't forget to subscribe maybe consider becoming a patron or a YouTube channel member. And as always, the information you need is in that description. And please leave comments. Leave comments like it helps with the algorithm. But I'm going to bring Denis in now. Good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Fine. You. Thank you, Paul, for having me today. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. So you are my first archaeologist uh, in 750 shows. Well, technically, I had, the I had Jennifer, who was a, a marine archaeologist, slightly different branch, but, but mostly diving. Um, and I know during the course of the show, we will talk about, you know, battlefield investigations, because most of the people that watching this, they've stood on battlefields with maps and said, where was the trench line? And that must have been the wood they attacked there. But looking at the looking at from below the ground is a different discipline. So I'm interested in, in, in learning a bit more about how that whole function works, because um, I think a lot of people watching this, they think of archaeology as like Roman stuff. That's kind of the. Yeah, the, the the really old stuff. Whereas World War II doesn't really somehow seem old enough to be archaeology, but we can discuss that later on. But anyway, um, just tell us a little about about, about your background. So basically, I was trained in uh, classical archaeology, uh, ancient Greece uh, mostly. I did lots of uh, digs in Greece in the Greek islands, and after that, uh, I always had that uh, background and keen interest in military history, especially Canadian military history. And uh, at one point, it was uh, keener than uh, my classical background, although I did enjoy it. So I decided at one point, after having been exposed to some uh, situation, the uh, emergence of uh, battlefield archaeology, I said, OK, I'm going to switch to that. So in 2013, I went back to Paris for a Master II uh, diploma in uh, battlefield or contemporary archaeology. And from then on, everything uh, went down and connected. It was like uh, all meant to be, if I could say so. Because when I was there, I had news that a team was digging a national archaeological team from France in RAP, uh, Institut National de Recherche Archaeologique Préventive, were digging in Normandy and they had found Canadian positions. I said, oh my God. So they talked about uh, the 5th Brigade, essentially the Régiment de Maisonneuve, mm -hmm. the uh, Calgary Highlanders and uh, the Blackwatch Royal Highland Regiment. So, oh my God, that's really my, uh, my part of the country. And I got in touch with the people and uh, we started to collaborate. And in the fall, that was in 2014. Uh, in the fall of 2014, they found, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, French archeologist Vincent Tessier, found a tiny bracelet with uh, an inscription. Uh, so there were initials, a service number. And on the other side, uh, from Rose, we can see in the next uh, slide, here yeah so the first view after it's been cleaned with uh chloridric acid hf b44812 so we knew immediately by the service number that it was canadian because it goes with regions and numbers uh, we were able to pinpoint that it was from artillery not sure exactly which regiment but uh funny it because uh, when i received the picture the bracelet was found on October 27, 2014. I received the picture on the 28th, which happens to be Harry's daughter's birthday. So <laughs> that was a good omen. It was a good sign. And then on the other side, if we see the next one, you have uh, from Rose. So the question people are asking me, although I make presentations about Harry, is that who's Rose? Did you find Rose? So, kind of. So the closest assumption would be that she might have been a British sweetheart that Harry might have dated for a while. And uh, after that, we don't know because that's a thing when I was looking for uh, 
Harry after I found out who he was in, in terms of at least his name. Uh, I was looking for Rose, so that might be a bias, but it wasn't Rose. Essentially, we'll see that later on. Yeah. But uh, it, it's it's part of a research that was uh, associated with the main goal, essentially. So, uh, yeah, that's how I got to that. And uh, I was able to participate. There were two digs in uh, the site where it was found. It's uh, fleury sur orne south of Caen. And there was a big dig uh, that lasted a few months in 2014. The other dig was uh, in 2016. So I took part in it uh, at the 2016 one and I uh, was able to see by myself uh, the site, which was huge. It was uh, half a kilometer. And uh, actually, because uh, it was a long period when uh, troop, Canadian troops were there. They were there from roughly July 21st, 1944 to August 4, just before going down to take part in the following operation uh, that took place like uh, totalized intractable. Yeah. But then uh, there was the 5th Brigade plus three uh, artillery regiments, 4, 5th and 6th. So that's a lot of uh, slit trenches. We found gun positions slit trenches, uh, over 800 of them, and that's only a part of what was uh, present at the time. But since it was, it was a safety uh, dig, uh, well, we knew that after a while, the plan was to build a warehouse for the tramways, in Ka, which has been done. We'll see that later on with an image. So all this to say that uh, it was uh, the beginning of an interesting quest, and we can see the next one. And what's interesting, I know we'll talk about this later on, is that, you know, you said you've been to Greece and, and dug things up. If you're doing a, a dig into ancient Greek relics or, you know, about, I said, Roman stuff, you're unlikely to uncover something where you can meet a family member of that, you know, because we're talking thousands of years ago as opposed to a few decades ago. So, you know, you've, you've done all disciplines of archaeology. Obviously, the older stuff has that kind of magic of being from a completely different time on earth when everything was very different. And yet recent archaeology must have that excitement of the fact that things are connected to people you can actually have a conversation with. That was my dad. That was, I, you know, French people saying, yes, I remember those troops digging in there. I remember them coming down that highway. Yes, they were over there near the hedge. So it, it the, the, the field of archaeology must have different, um, parts of it that, that it excite you depending on the era absolutely and you raise a very uh, relevant point paul because uh it's very i, I think it's safe to assume that uh, if we find a greek vase the owner is no longer alive <laughs> yeah say so that's <laughs> mine give it back yeah <laughs> so it would be unlikely to find him but uh this uh, modern battlefield archaeology brings another dimension and you you mention it in your uh presentation it's the fact that uh, there's a there could be a relationship and there is yeah. actually with people who are still alive and i'll never forget the feeling when i had the confirmation because i had to get it officially that this bracelet belonged to a man from york harry edward fox who was a young gunner and now i was able to get in touch with his family and to me it changes the whole scope of the research yeah. and i find that the greatest legacy of such a research, albeit from a, a scientific point of view, is the connection with the family. And I'm very grateful to them because I was welcomed like their own son. And it's a, it's a bond that is created that uh, literally shrinks the scale of time, literally. Yeah. And in fact, uh, we were taught uh, when we did the history in archaeology, oh, don't get uh, too close to your emotions. You have to remain calm. But when you see and you live and experience a situation like that, you say, okay, I still have the scientific part of my brain that deals with that. But on the, the other hand, I thought about Dr. Emmett Brown in the Back to the Future saying, what if the future changes? What the heck? So the same with this. Emotions are allowed, I think, to be part of your uh, research in integrating them to give a, a global result. And I, I find that it's a, a lifelike, uh, life life. Uh, uh, changing experience, sorry, that yeah. could happen maybe once in a lifetime or could not happen. So I, I found I was very fortunate to be able to to live and to share it above all. Brilliant. Well, back to the slides. We've got loads of photos to get through. So uh, back to you. So uh, after I was able to, I think it took a while because uh, at the time, uh, 
Library and Archives Canada was uh, redacting the files. I was not a family member, so it was restricted. All this to say after a while got the info. And I started the research with uh, Harry's uh, mother. She was British. Her family, family name was Gur, G-U-R-R, uh, -R, sorry. Uh, no, G, sorry, like George. Uh, and then I said, okay, what am I going to do to find out? So I expanded the research on internet. So it's not only history, archaeology, it's anthropology, databases. And I always tell my students, keep it as broad as you can. It's not only one field, don't think in a silo. Go and take every resource you can find to find the answer that will provide you with results. So I went on internet and uh, found some uh, databases and cemeteries. Then I found uh, one photo, I will see that later on, of a tombstone. Uh, at first, I wasn't sure, but I had assumed that the usually veterans came back in their same village or area after the war, which was the case also for Harry. So he was from York and he came back to the Toronto area. And at the end of his life, he was living in Milton. So basically, I was kind of lucky. I found that picture of a tombstone. We'll see that soon. And I uh, say, OK, what if it's him? So I got in touch with the young uh, woman who had posted uh, the uh, photo. And uh, she said, yeah, I know someone from the family. Would you like me to get in touch? I said, sure. So uh, a week passed. And then she sent me this uh, excerpt from uh, a newspaper, a local newspaper that uh, was dated back from 2004. And uh, it was about the Legion in Milton that was celebrating a milestone. So among the veterans that were photographed uh, was a, a gentleman named uh, Harry E. Fox. So since I had his file, I checked for two uh, key details that would be uh, very important. So first, his medals. He had five, so I checked they all matched the five so i said okay that's a good sign then i knew that he had lost uh left finger this one uh in a gunnery accident the breach uh, blew up so the gun was blown to bits nobody was killed and but he lost a finger so if you check his left hand it's folded except for one one finger so my assumption was why would one finger be in extension except if it's a prosthesis so uh -huh. i I was quite sure, 99-ish, that this was the man. But I needed a scientific confirmation that would come from the family. So another week passed. And then I received an email from uh, that uh, young woman, Chelsea Hand, who uh, said, great news, the need, the family confirmed every detail, a service number, everything. So I said, oh, my God, I can't believe it. So this was uh, actually the confirmation of what I called now what I call now, sorry, uh, a case study. So it's a Canadian archaeological battlefield case study because from the ground up to a living family, we have a, the whole sequence done by the book in terms of research on the ground with all the context. And the context is uh, in archaeology when you have all the layers that have been uh, undisturbed and found as is when they were left. So it was like uh, a short miracle, actually. So we can go to the next one. This is actually the, uh, I should have put that before, but the tombstone I found and actually uh, Harry and his wife, Doreen. So as I said at the beginning, I was looking for Rose, say, okay, maybe it's not Rose and it proved to be uh, Doreen. So once it was confirmed, uh, then it led to the, the smoking gun and the missing link actually. So the next one. So we see here, once I met with the family and actually the first meeting was very emotional and I was wondering, what am I going to say? Uh, and all of a sudden, I had six people, including Harry's daughter. Uh, and I started to tell them what I knew about Harry, where he had been and everything. I say, oh, my God, we didn't know that because Harry didn't speak a lot like the many veterans. They didn't want their families to hear uh, terrible stories. So they kept it for themselves or talked about it with their uh, brothers in arms, which knew what it was. So... I had the details and I shared them uh, happily with the family. And then when I met uh, Harry's family, we had this uh, photo where Harry is here with his platoon. And I cannot help but think what happened to each man here. What was their lives, their destiny? So it's a kind of question we can ask. The next one. 
So a close up from uh, Harry, a young man. He was uh, 18 when he uh, joined up and 19. Actually, he turned 20 in July uh, 44 uh, when he was at the front because uh, uh, his regiment had landed on uh, July 8. Uh, the baptism of fire was on July the 12th in the battle for Cap Piquet. And yeah. then uh, he was... Uh, he became a man uh, rapidly like many of his uh, brothers in arms. Next one. <clears throat> he, he was assigned to uh, the famous 25-pounder, uh, which I don't know in details. I still have a lot to learn, but uh, I know it's a very reliable gun. Uh, and uh, one thing I mentioned in the book is uh, at one point, uh, the teams that were, or the crew that were operating it were so efficient that they were able to fire 10 rounds per minute as the gun was planned for five. So some German prisoners asked, uh, well, can we see that automatic gun? Because we don't have anything like that. No, it's because they're so efficient that they can fire at that rate. <laughs> well, I'm you know, a, if it's possible to be a fan of a weapon, because I don't like death and destruction, but if I, if it can, if it is possible to be a fan of a weapon, I think the 25-pounder was just about the greatest bit of field artillery of World War II um, and still using it in various countries till 20, 30 years after war. So... Um, yeah, and, and we don't talk enough about artillery in, in in practice because people talk about the infantry and commandos and the fighter pilots and, and the artillery is such an essential, integral part of the success of normally a huge, huge arm. Um, so I'm glad it's I'm glad that the story is also touching artillery. So yeah, 25 pounder. It's true, Paul. And I mentioned it in the book uh, that uh, artillery was le parent pauvre, as we say in French. Of, uh, but the contribution is uh, monumental and we cannot uh, help uh, but uh, think about the, the uh, key or pivotal contribution of artillery. Yeah. So he was in the sixth uh, field uh, RCA. I found a shoulder pad that was given by a friend of mine, uh, an original one. The next one. So we see all here the uh, fifth, sixth. And so Harry was in uh, the sixth field regiment, sold in a troop A in the 13th field battery. Next one. So I took a modern map to show uh, our viewers where the situation was. So you see the city of Caen and just next to it, the uh, airfield of Carpiquet. But down south is uh, fleury sur orne which was in 1944, like many French villages, a typical rural farming village uh, with fields around that. But today uh, the city has spread its tentacles up to uh, actually a good part of what uh, used to be the archaeological site. So the city is gaining in. And today we'll see in a few uh, few minutes also, like this uh, photo here taken in 1946, uh, raises several interesting uh, point of view. You see the River Orne uh, going down uh, on the left. And you see uh, that big structure on the top right corner was actually uh, prisoners of war camp because, uh, as we know, when the Allied landed, they uh, rapidly uh, encountered and uh, had to deal with uh, thousands and thousands of German prisoners. Uh, first of all, they had them on beaches and they shipped them to Great Britain, but Great Britain said, okay, we, there's no room. So they, uh, a, pl a plan was deployed to build what they call PWT, Prisoners of War Temporary Enclosures, uh, all over France, mostly in Normandy, there was one in uh, the village of nonal le pin uh, mm -hmm. And when we talk about the first camp, basically it's a fence with people in it. That's it. So, uh, but it was 1944. Uh, uh, France had been occupied for four years, and occupation uh, took uh, most uh, quite a toll on uh, the mental and physical of people. So I can understand that uh, the reaction was not always very uh, the way it could it could be. So basically. Uh, that camp grew up, was transferred to French authorities in 1945 and uh, was opened until 1947. But at its peak in 1946, it uh, was welcoming uh, 12,000 German uh, prisoners of war. And one of them, Hans Flint, I was able to find his uh, testimony, said they had to eat cats and fight for a uh, scrap of foods and garbage. So the conditions were very dire, but if you think what the Germany, the Germans had done to uh, the occupied countries, it's part of the, the scheme of history. And you see also the area in the middle, uh, which are the fields, that's exactly where the 5th Brigade was with uh, the 
uh, artillery regiment and you see uh, a straight gray line at the bottom that was a road that was built by uh, allied troops actually allied canadian and british to uh, transfer material and it was nicknamed the le chemin des anglais it's still there but uh, also when uh, the dig began in uh, 2014 they found uh, batteries from the flak because the the germans were there uh, well, a few days after D-Day, but then they had to move because obviously Allied were progressing. And we're not sure, we'll see some photos in a minute, we're not sure if the um, uh, these flag batteries were belonging to the Dritte Flak Corps, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dritte Flak Corps, many archives were destroyed. But what I found out for sure is that on June the 10th, 1944, the uh, Corps command post of uh, the the Dritte Flag Corps was in Evresy, which is a little southwest of uh, fleury sur -Anne. So we cannot confirm with certainty that these were Dritte Flag Corps. Obviously, it was flag batteries, but so it's 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 good to be a little bit cautious here, not to say something without uh, being uh, asserted with uh, the yeah. primary sources. Next one. So today, uh, as it is now in 2023, the upper part where Actually, the prisoners of war camp would have been like partly uh, crossing with the actual structure, which is the warehouse for the tramway in uh, Caen. And it's interesting because the camp was called La Grace de Dieu, the grace of God. And the tramway station uh, actually is called uh, La Grace de Dieu when you stop there. So there's an interesting link here. In, uh, no, I've, I've seen that as a name for tram station, but I had no idea that it had a connection with World War II. This, right. this is the kind of detail you get from an archaeologist. I'm, I'm loving it because um, you know people are saying in the sidebar that you're 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 layering the information in, you're laying it out there, building it up bit by bit. It's it's beautifully done. Well done, sir. Thank you. And it's uh, one of the peripheral science that I uh, tell my students to pay attention to toponymy. If there's a name, there's a reason. There has to be something before that. And here it's a crystal clear case. It's very interesting. So uh, actually discovered the site. We knew that it was uh, something to be done, but at least it was possible to, to find uh, the site. And the, the main goal, I forgot to say that before, but the main goal of the dig for INRAP was not the Second World War, but uh, a Neolithic site, which is uh, among the best in uh, Europe, and uh, they found 24 uh, monuments, Neolithic monuments. So just to uh, put a date on Neolithic, it's roughly 6,000 to 3,000 BC. And uh, actually, it's funny, we'll see a picture uh, in a few minutes from now where both eras are coming together. That was because I was going to ask you why they chose that particular area, because, I mean, I was out that way near Caen a few days ago. And, I mean, it's one big battlefield in 1944. There's not one square inch anywhere sort of Caen, south, east, west that isn't isn't fought over. That's that whole late June, July and into August period. So I was going to ask you why they chose it. But, of course, being a World War II guy, I didn't think they were looking for Neolithic. Thing. I think they're, just, they're looking for tanks, surely. That's the way my brain works. Okay, thanks for clearing that up. No problem. It's funny, but when they started to find grenades and stuff like, okay, they didn't have a stand gun in Neolithic. So <laughs> the next one. So that's the plan that was drawn by my colleague. And we see all the dots actually are trenches, slit trenches or larger trenches. We see the large red line is uh, Le Chemin des Anglais. And the uh, big dig of 2014 uh, was the one that allowed to find quite a lot, uh, among other things, gun positions where Harry Edward Fox's gun was. You see there's a little square on the left uh, to the upper part of uh, Fouille 2014. That's where uh, Harry's gun position was, just in that little tiny corner. But thank God it was found. The next one. So we see today uh, in six years, actually seven, I should say, uh, it changed quite a lot. You see in the upper part, uh, the warehouse for the tramways. Down there, there's a mill. Uh, transforming because it's a uh, limestone uh, ground. Eh? It's uh, sorry, ideal for digging because you have the uh, soil, topsoil for farming. Once you remove that, and it was removed with uh, backhoes and tractors, but then you get literally to the ideal, I would say, situation where you can teach archaeology when soils are not the same colors. Because, for instance, when you dig and it's all clay, almost the same color, same texture. It's quite a challenge to tell the difference, but 
Such was not the case here. It was super clean. We'll see that in picture. That was an ideal situation. But I, once we uh, were digging there, we realized how hard it must have been in 1944 to dig with pick and axe and shovels in the limestone on top of being bombed and everything. So uh, it was quite an endeavor. So we see that there are still parts left, but again, uh, the city is coming down and there are other modern, obviously, priorities uh, taking place. Yeah. So we see here, uh, my colleague called it the crab or pincer crab or crab pincer um, slit trenches. So these were the batteries from the, the flak, so the, the Luftwaffe. So we don't know, as I said, if it's the Dritte Flak Corps, but those were batteries and we found uh, shells from 88 millimeter guns and uh, it was crystal clear. They were well uh, designed, uh, very thorough, and uh, we're not sure how long they were there, but they were reoccupied by Canadian uh, owners once they were on site. So that's why uh, once they were there, uh, they reused it, taking some of the furniture from the nearby houses or anything to make it comfortable uh, as long as they could. Mm -hmm. So this is a drawing here again by uh, my colleagues uh, of the um, crab pincer. We can see on the ground what it looks like. It's very well organized. It's uh, for protection. So it, there are angles to prevent well as much as they could for shrapnels or anything that could fly around. And we see the, the organization here that has been done. There are some trenches like uh, in uh, Semi Cross or others. Uh, lots of bottles were found in those, uh, wine bottles, beer bottles, mostly uh, Canadian trenches. I found one, actually, I dig, dig up one with uh, lots of uh, bottles, mostly British beer, because it was uh, closer to export than Canadian beer. But I guess the result was quite the same uh, enjoyment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next one. So we see today the uh, straight line is Le Chemin des Anglais. You see, it's still the one that is like a bit of a snake, uh, shifting a bit is uh, something that was there in 1944 too. So it's quite common. Actually, we see that from antiquity too. Once there was a road well positioned, you don't reinvent the wheel. Why should we build another road as there's one? We just re, uh, reset it a bit and uh, make some modifications and we can use the road again. So that's what they did. And I guess uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, business is there, but they seem to deal with it limestone or gravel or sand or something like that. But the batteries would have been south of uh, Le Chemin des Anglais, so not far where we can see that pile of uh, uh, gravel or whatever it is. So tell me, when, when you know, you said that the purpose of this was to look for Neolithic um, period, but that clearly they don't, they know there's going to be other layers there. You don't go just immediately dig down and find Neolithic stuff an inch below. So presumably, although they're not looking for World War II stuff. They're expecting that they're going to find World War II stuff as they go down because it would be one of the expected layers. So so I'm assuming that the team, because you weren't involved in this first dig, the team there would have specialists from different eras with, with different data sets so that when they find the, the, the bit of, I don't know, corrugated iron, they go, oh, that's World War II. And then they find a bit of clay pottery, oh, that's Roman. So they just switch to whoever's got the, the, the skill set. Is that how it works? Yeah, actually, they knew in advance. I asked my colleague, uh, did you know before you you started the dig that there were World War II remains? He said, yes, we did, because we made surveys. And the surveys were quite revealing uh, the two main uh, epochs or eras, I would say. And they knew that they sooner or later they would uh, hit something like that. Did they know that it was that big? I, I assume they did too, but uh, it was quite a large entrenchment uh, and there's another one similar to that that was between uh, if and bra that was for the seventh brigade but uh, it was not uncommon it, it, it's not well spread but it's something that happened and uh, what makes it unique also is that it's it was so long i mean we're, we're talking about almost two weeks in the same spot and of course germans knew they were there and they moved the guns around uh so on uh, uh, after a few days but because a gun is a, an easier target than a slip yeah, trench so yeah but yeah they, they, they knew it in fact yeah and there was a colleague of mine who was a specialist who is a specialist actually in world war ii and he, he was very very useful in identifying all kinds of material 
And I assume oh. Ian Cara just asked, you would have had someone there to check for ordnance, you know, an EOD guy, because whenever you're digging on World War II stuff, there is always a chance of finding something that goes bang. It's true. They found the uh, Beaufort ammunition at one point. And uh, the procedure is really, they call the deminers. They know how to yep. deal with that. They dispose of that. Uh, and that, that's uh, interesting because when you talked in uh, the beginning of the show that the difference between antiquity and now, you don't get killed by a Greek vase, but you've, you can find stuff here, especially in the northern part of France, uh, where the First World War was. There, there are pretty big shells over there and even chemical shells with poison gas and everything. So it's not something you want to toy around. Yeah like that it could be very dangerous yeah brilliant are we moving on yeah so an interesting anecdote here this is a well-known photo uh because uh, civilians were hiding there was a quarry under the site uh, la carrière saint which was producing beer and i had the uh, honor to interview one uh, one woman who was 11 years old and she was there in uh, july 1944 with her parents she was liberated by Canadians and she said that uh, one day she saw soldiers coming into the quarry and they didn't look like Germans and they were speaking French so who are these guys and she said oh they were from Le Régiment de Maisonneuve who occupied uh, fleury sur on July 19 they had received the order to take the village and they did it so they were liberated and she said that as soon as the soldiers came in his father stood up uh, began to sing La Marseillaise the soldier stood to attention and then everyone was, uh, I mean, liberated. Uh, they were giving cakes and uh, cookies. And she said, she used a very interesting word. As she said, we could breathe. After four years, we could breathe. Mm -hmm. There was air. So that's how she described it. And this uh, young fellow here is uh, Private Pierre-Paul Beauchamp from the Régiment de Maisonneuve. And in another book by uh, a veteran from uh, the Régiment de Maisonneuve, a famous soldier called uh, Jean-Charles uh, Charlie Forbes, who uh, was uh, very who, the well known in Canada, actually, uh, was uh, telling a story about Pierre Paul Beauchamp in his book that was published in 1994 or 2002. I'm not sure. I have to double check. And uh, what happened with Pierre Paul Beauchamp is that he went away for a while, more or less deserted, and came back. So he was tried for uh, desertion. And uh, Lieutenant Forbes was in charge of defending him. And he said, OK, since you came back, it's going to be considered absence without leave because you you returned. So finally, he was acquitted, but he was asked to return to the front. So I, I thought about uh, looking for this guy, Pierre Paul Bouchard, but I didn't push the research. But it would be interesting what he, beca what he became. Yeah. And there's Dr. Coyier here, who was uh, from the civil safety, uh, checking the Nebelwerfer. Uh, that was found at the entrance of those quarries. They were well camouflaged. And so this is an quarry like that. And researches are being made, actually, like this uh, photo here by my colleagues from INRAP uh, to uh, literally map in 3D all the uh, quarries that are uh, uh, like underground cities for a while. They were there for almost 50 days. And it was a, a whole world that was living there trying to do their best. And uh, this photo is very interesting because the flag that is here uh, was uh, fabricated or created by the woman's uh, father I interviewed, sorry. So uh, since it was forbidden to fly a French flag during occupation, they created one. So he took a diaper in white, a red dress and a blue dress. And here we have the French uh, tricolor. Uh, the flag was given to uh, a padre from one regiment in 1946 who brought it back to Canada. And uh, the lady, Madame Yvette Letimoni, who lives in Caen now, asked me if I could find it. I'm, I'm looking for it, but I couldn't find it yet. But we don't know. If it could be found, that would be great to, mm. obviously, to have it in a museum because it shows the determination and the relief of a population who had been occupied for four years. So this photo also is uh, was taken in, in fleury sur on July 28, 1944. I'll double check uh, to which regiment uh, these uh, gentlemen are uh, belonging. It could be the 4th, 5th or the 6th, but they might have been in Harry's regiment too. But they are definitely uh, gunners. We see uh, behind them uh, the stuff that was used. So it's a very uh, 
yeah, it's it's interesting to think that this was taken on site as it was occupied. Brad, Brad is asking which unit brought the flag back. Did you know which particular unit it was? Oh boy, that I'm not sure. No, I'm not okay. sure. No worries. Uh, I was told that it might have been uh, Les Fusiliers Mont Royal, but again, it's a uh, heyse, so I'd, uh, I'd rather be sure. Okay, thank uh, you. Today is a very uh, coincidental photo, too, because today is uh, July 25th, so it's Operation Spring, and a photo from the Phantom Group here. They were digging on the same day to the day 78 years ago uh, in If. If is actually you cross the street and you're uh, uh, across uh, the other village uh, if you cross the street you're in Fleury the other one is if so they were digging slick trenches and I said since we found so many slick trenches it's uh, it must have been a tedious and uh, boring uh, work to do <laughs> every infantryman's best friend is his shovel and the same applies to artillerymen as well it's uh you, you dig you don't like digging holes but you're grateful for them when the shells start landing so that's that that's what the veterans used to tell me yeah you hated digging them but you're bloody glad you had them when the when the when the metal starts falling but yeah great photos it's true yeah, it's so true yeah so i found a <clears throat> sorry a manual from 1941 that explained uh, in very thorough details how to uh, create different types of trenches and we found uh, trenches like the chevron one was very popular on the side, uh, the, the single one. The, so it depended on the position that you had to protect and where the enemy was, obviously, uh, each uh, trench protecting the other. So the, we see, I think, in the next one. Yeah, see, you see the chevron here. And when I was talking about the ground in the limestone, when it's brown, it's earth, it's been filled, and then you have the limestone. It's almost like uh, the, it is, I think, the ideal situation to learn archaeology and see the context. But whatever is not there, there are, it's very unlikely that you will find artifact, but once in the trenches, and we found lots of stuff in there. And you, you can tell by the, the photo that the site was huge. I was just going to make that comment by the size of the van there at the background. I mean, I've seen a few digs in my time, and but that's that's a massive, I mean, that's almost like a football field there. Uh, it is. It, it was very, very big. Brilliant stuff. Uh, yeah, there has some rain. This is a trench I dug up and I found uh, bottles of beer. And a colleague of mine published an article, very relevant article, on uh, the importance of alcohol to sustain the morale. Uh, different situations uh, across the, the conflict. And there were uh, different bottles. Most, several were intact. We see like sauce bottle here. So those tiny details tell us, okay, they were eating meat. Because I told my mom when she was alive, say, oh, A1 sauce, for instance. Well, it's used with meat, so we, we knew they were eating meat. But it's just like a very interesting detail to confirm uh, the fact that it was done on site. And so you can be sure that those bottles uh, had been used by Canadians. And uh, one funny anecdote is that some of them tried the famous or infamous Calvados or Calva. Uh, either you like or you don't, but uh, some soldiers, uh, one of them uh, abused of it and he, he wanted to attack the 12th SS Panzer with his bulldozer. So the, his buddy said, okay, we, we better calm down a bit. So he slept it off under the D7. It was that better. is a really brilliant story. Getting a guy, I, I can't stand Calvados myself, but um, getting it, it's a uh, you know, giving you that courage, that battle courage to go and take on the 12th SS and the bulldozer. You've had if that's if that that happens to you, folks, you've had too much Calvados. That's that's Woody's words of wisdom there. If drinking alcohol makes you want to take on an enemy in a bulldozer, you've had too much to drink. Fantastic stories. And so, the, beer, the beer is 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 fact is also interesting because it's as you said there, it's indicating that they weren't just there for 24 hours because you don't break open the beer if you're in a position for 24 hours in the middle of a battle. This is a place they were clearly at for, as you say, a you know, couple of weeks because they get the beer ration. Oh, yeah. And uh, where we found uh, one cap bottle from uh, Molson, uh, but most of it was either British or some French beer, but uh, for practical and technical reasons, uh, it was mostly British. Uh, Brilliant stuff. British. Yeah. So this is the, the site uh, where uh, the bracelet was found. It's the second trench from the left. You see there's a little ridge that uh, covers it because it was taken before the bracelet was uh, taken out by my colleague who found it. He was alone on site uh, on October 27, 2014. 
He dug as many slip trenches as he could to gather as many information because he knew it would disappear after the dig. And we can see clearly there's a little bar uh, up there in the photo where the gun position had been leveled with a bulldozer. And it's in the, the war diary. It's mentioned very clearly. We uh, use the bulldozer to level out and put the gun there. You can see all the trenches around. And when I talk about context, that's what I mean. Everything here is as it was in July 1944. And it's, it's a paradise for archaeologists because everything was in the trenches, whatever they left there, cans, what they were eating, beer or anything. And obviously the bracelet, which was under an ammunition box. But then you can see uh, how the daily life of gunners, not from the books, but from the ground, what are the clues that uh, they're telling you? And the ground, I always tell my students too, is very stubborn. It's a good news. The ground keeps every detail, try, traces of everything. So providing you can go slowly in there, you can make them talk and uh, they have a lot to tell. Brilliant stuff. So here is uh, under the that little ridge, I would call it like that. You see the handle of a ammunition box. Underneath, my colleague told me that the soil had been tramped, so they were standing. And uh, an interesting detail is that these gunners' slit trenches are deeper than the other ones because they needed protections. Not that the infantrymen were not important, but guns were uh, capital, so they made sure they had protection. It's quite deep, actually. I would say maybe 50, 60 centimeters. It's uh, it's quite uh, deep, and it was found as is. And we can see in the next one, uh, before the... The, the bracelet was under that ammunition box and with the sun, we can see the, the soil that was tramped. Uh, also, not related to that, but we found lots of uh, ammo boxes and everything uh, related to, obviously, uh, 25 pounders. Uh, the next one. And that, that's they're in good condition. You know, I'm, seeing, I'm, a, I'm, in a, I'm seeing ammunition boxes dug up that are just, you know, they 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 literally fall apart in your hands. You know, th that soil there must have been pretty damn dried, and uh, to keep those in that. I mean, I know this is this was you know nearly a decade ago, but th that that's remarkable because ammo ammo boxes are really thin metal. They're 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 not they're not built to last. It's true. You know. and, uh, I was lucky because I found this one, and it said, uh, "Oh, you found uh, an almost perfect one. Uh, you lucky bastard." So I said, "Well." It's uh, because I'm Canadian and uh, these are Canadian uh, positions, so that's good omen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So all kinds of uh, boxes to carry the, the shells and everything. There were quite a few, but they picked up lots of stuff when they left too. Next yeah. one. So uh, yeah, the one I found actually, this one was uh, full of earth and we know that they were using it to uh, create sort of a barrier around the gun to protect from shrapnels and bullets, uh, some sort of protection in some ways. But uh, we were not sure, uh, as it was heavy, I say, what's inside of it. We decided to open it, and it it confirmed what we had seen in uh, the testimonies, that uh, it was filled with earth and served as a barrier uh, to protect around the gun. Okay, we've got a couple of questions for you before we move on. So, um, and I, I know the answer to the first one, but you, Yost in the Netherlands is saying, Obviously, you're plotting all these finds on a chart. You know, you're, you're going through these photos quite like it's a bit Indiana Jones. We found this. We found this. And what you're not showing us is clearly that mundane level of we found this here, measuring it, what distance. You know, so, so tell us all that that process is all being done all the time. Uh, actually, the whole site was mapped very thoroughly. Uh, each trench was uh, how deep it was. Not every artifact, but uh, significant artifacts were located. But the whole site is uh, perfectly plotted. Yeah, it's uh, it's very impressive. Yeah, brilliant. So, uh, as you mentioned, it's in uh, excellent condition. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors, and archaeology can play a lot. Uh, if it's uh, if there's pH, if it's humid, if it's dry. Uh, I always give the example of uh, what they call the bog people in uh, Scandinavian. They found bodies and you can see the beard. Uh, the man is like uh, sleeping. It's called uh, the man of Toland. Uh, he had been sacrificed, but still it, it looks like if he's sleeping, but he was in a bog. So the chemical composition kept him like almost of his, uh, 
was uh, dead yesterday. So it's very impressive, depending on the ground. Mm. Gary August is saying, had you done a geophys uh, survey before you started digging there? Yes, there are, uh, I'm quite sure I'll have to confirm that, but uh, whatever is uh, metallic will resonate uh, definitely yeah. before, yes. But if you're looking for Neolithic stuff, you're not going to start with geophysics because they're not, not that much metal in Neolithic. Dan, correct me if I'm wrong. No, 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 no. It's all, it's all about stone. Right. Brilliant. This is, we're, by the way, people are absolutely loving it. We've not done anything quite like this on the channel before. It's, it's both, we're learning about the process of, of, of battlefield archaeology, but we're also having this human story and information about the battle told to us at the same time. It's kind of hitting everything. Thank you very much. I'm glad to share it. So uh, modern views of uh, what it looked like to, when we carried, and it's pretty heavy, and we're, we're not talking about 5.5 uh, shells here, which weighed 100 pounds uh, on average, but I mean, uh, gunners were uh, guys who were pretty uh, pretty much in shape to, to deal with that, especially with the 25 pounders, you have to get the shell in, the ramrod, push it uh, close, and then put the shell in, fire, close the breech and fire, and start again so it must have been quite uh, impressive to see them in action yeah but believe it or not i have crewed a 25 pounder a few times back in my living history reenactment days and this was just for little displays in an arena for 20 minutes and believe me picking up a few shells and loading them in and then put it, it you know it you find muscles you didn't know you had so uh, i i couldn't imagine doing it every day for years in combat yes the strong guys and thank you again for these amazing photos no so, problem Shell. Uh, yeah, I had one anecdote about that, uh, Paul. Uh, on July 22nd, uh, shortly after the 6th field arrived in fleury sur orne they were asked by the 6th Brigade to uh, make a counter battery to support the, uh, actually to, to try to stop the German counter attacks. And on that day, the 6th field alone fired 14,000 rounds. That means 600 rounds per gun and it was so hot that at one point the peel uh, the paint was peeling off the barrels and the gun became uh, the barrels became red sort of so uh, but it, it, according to the war diary uh, they were able to knock out 14 german tanks and stop the counter attacks so as you mentioned earlier the importance of artillery here we go we have a crystal clear example of what it could do to support the poor lad who were uh in the field so here yeah uh a shell and uh, those shells uh, some of them were found but uh, were immediately taken out the field to be protected in uh with the lock in a big uh, container because uh had they been left there they would have been gone the day after for sure so uh, and again i'm not a specialist of all the details here i still have a lot to learn but uh, all the details of it, the, the batch, when was it built uh, or created? And then if there's a misfire, they have to be back to say who did that, when and why didn't it work or something like that. So those are important details and it's uh, military precision that helps us to pinpoint. Mm. Did you happen to know whether most of the shells they found were brass or were they worse? Because I know towards the end of the war, the Allies are having to use more steel for shells, which wasn't as, as, as conducive right away because brass is the has the right qualities for artillery. Did, did you know if they were brass or steel or mixture? Those I saw were of brass. Right, okay. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. So here we see a Neolithic monument, at the, the two parallel lines that are going there, because uh, they were uh, conceived according to the solstice, so the change of seasons. Those uh, rural farming uh, societies were living like almost everywhere in Europe and in Mediterranean according to the rhythm of season. So uh, the change of season was a very important moment for celebration, for the crops and everything like that. So those are huge monuments. I mean, over 150 meters long, uh, carved by stone and roughly one meter a day. So that gives you a sense of how long it could have been. And you see there's a gray patch here. So that's the some remnants of the prisoners of war that is literally superimposing over the uh, Neolithic mind. So archaeology is all about that. It's a, it's a puzzle. One era, especially in Europe here, it's a little bit different in North America, but in Europe, no matter where you go, 
the question is not will you find something, but what will you find at oh, Neolithic, medieval, or prehistory? Depending how deep you go, where you are, obviously, you can find uh, the choice is yours. It's all you can eat Buffett. And it's it's fascinating the the kind of the paradox of this Neolithic, you know, you call it religious worship, whatever. It's it's a, it's 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 connecting with with greater powers, and yet beside it, layering through it is human beings trying to kill each other on a, on a, on a almost biblical scale. The fact that these two things are in exactly the same place, this kind of celebration of, of harvest and, 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 and death right there. It's, it's extraordinary. I guess that's, that's, that's what archaeology is. It's the, all those things happening in the same space over, over, over generations. It's true, Paul. And it's, uh, it's a bit puzzling because when you realize that you say, my God, you question human nature and uh, well there's a lot of there would be a lot to say about that but uh, yeah it, it leaves you with uh, questions yeah and we're getting a question about what's happening uh, with these uh, the, the items that were being found that the ammunition boxes and the shells were they restored Did they go to museums uh most of them are kept in uh, reserves and uh, they might go if they're restored they will go to museums but they're not thrown away okay thank you moving on Another interesting uh, uh, photo here of uh, two eras. So the brown dark trace is a Neolithic monument. And on top of it are Canadian, uh, well, or bottles of beers that were uh, consumed by Canadians. So if you think that those bottles were consumed likely in 1944, because that's was when they were there, and the Neolithic monument is uh, 3,000 your road so there we almost have five thousand years between the bottles and what's underneath wow and yet not that you know that not much True. um measurement yeah i'm trying to think of the word depth is the word i'm thinking for no pe people are people are getting more out of this show than they were perhaps expecting yeah they they saw the listing and, yeah it's a story about a bracelet that would be cool but they we're, we're exploring so many pardon the palm let pun layers of history today it's really really fantastic thank you uh, coming back to that, uh, you, you call that biblical uh, destruction. So we found uh, there were a few planes who crashed on the site. Some Allied planes, we found uh, ear uh, phones and stuff like that. We're not sure because it, the plane was blown to pieces. So we're not sure what type of Allied plane. We uh, should study the serial number and stuff like that. But uh, one thing for sure is that uh, German Folkwolf 190 was shut down and uh, the, the breach uh, gun or boxes, should I say, uh, were found. And uh, with the serial number, it was identified as being having been fabricated in Czechoslovakia, occupied Czechoslovakia. And uh, this Pfennig was found from the pilot. The pilot was uh, vaporized or he didn't exist anymore, but some of the artifacts were found. And it's interesting to see, again, these tiny details related to that big picture uh, of war that takes place basically between small human episodes that added together becomes the big picture. That's why I, I always tell my student, I repeat myself, start with one object, open the door, and then from that short story, you'll get to broader and broader and you'll have the big picture. But it's yeah. a way to understand, okay, who was that guy? How was he living? And from then on, you have the whole thing. The next one we see, I think, yeah, the dent, a huge dent uh, where the Fogwolf crashed. So, uh, and there were uh, batteries of uh, Beaufort, Canadian Beaufort on, on site too. So they, we don't know exactly uh, when it was shut down. I checked in the war diaries. There are some mentions uh, of a German planes shut down, uh, especially in the fourth field artillery war diary. Uh, we're not sure either were they taking off from uh, Chartres or Paris area. It's not that far. Again, this would have to be uh, analyzed. But the one thing for sure, that plane never came back. Again, uh, daily life uh, on uh, at the front. So a gun position. See, it's been, there's a little ridge worked out with a bulldozer. This is not Harry's gun. It's another one. And there's that long pole here with uh, cans attached to it. So this was a mobile shower. So this was hooked to a truck with water so that soldier, soldiers could shower. And it's mentioned uh, in uh, the sixth field uh, war diary that one day the bulldozer came in and the mobile shower came in. So uh, that was a day of uh, uh, 
to be happy. And uh, on the left, you have a, a plaque of marbles, very likely taken from a house to stand uh, on it, maybe while showering. We're not sure. But uh, there were lots of things that were uh, taken from nearby houses, destroyed houses, obviously, but uh, to try to uh, make it comfortable, essentially. Also, soldiers were very ingenious, uh, so they used uh, jerry cans that they pierced with holes and put uh, fuel in it to, uh, as a brazier to warm up food. And uh, that uh, particular one is very uh, clear visibly in terms of uh, location. And it's uh, what they were doing, eating, on a, obviously, on the site, like more, I wouldn't say camping because it was not funny. But still, uh, it's something they tried to make their everyday life as normal as it could be. Because uh, when I did my research, I, I found out nothing new, but things we, we knew in advance that uh, there was not only the heat, the dust, lice, wasps, rain, mud, uh, fatigue, lack of sleep on top of being shelled and uh, fired at. So this must have been uh, emotionally exhausting and uh, you had to keep keep going. I mean, uh, every day you, you might lose a, a body, and you have to to go because that's the that's was uh, that's what the mission was. But the, it, it brings us an insight on uh, how these young men, how courageous they were, and resilient to go through that every day. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, this is an interesting cultural uh, artifact here, uh, and. Uh, when it was found, they were not sure what it was, but the Canadian former military said, oh, it's a toaster, because uh, Canadians were e uh, eating, were still eat uh, sliced bread, but French didn't eat that, they eat baguette. So uh, you don't toast a baguette on that, but uh, I thought about camping when I saw that, it's so obvious, but it's a cultural uh, item that determines who was on site. For American sites, I know my colleagues told me they found uh, Coca-Cola bottles, chewing gum, Every site has is more or less its typical cultural icon that uh, helps to determine basically mm -hmm. who was there. But that that is definitely Canadian. And again, uh, when I told my mom, uh, see how I found a one sauce? Yeah, yeah, she, I remember that. So that's funny because you can see those Bakelite caps uh, that were used, a very popular material at the time, uh, was used to. Uh, so you cannot help but think, okay, who? held that bottle, what did they eat on that day? And you have a little brown bottle on the side, it's Beauvril, uh, beef sauce or ox sauce. Yeah, 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 Luther, looks like Beauvril, yep, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so basically they were eating meat, but there's uh, also a button uh, near the uh, white French beer. Oh, yeah, got it, yep. Yeah. From Bayou, I, I think you live in Bayou part, right? I do, yep, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. so that's, uh, that one will be uh, Related to your place here, and is that there's the white thing? Is that an enam the enamel top of a beer bottle? Is that the you know, like That's the like right. a yeah, correct. So some of them were local, but as I mentioned, most of them were British uh, used. And uh, yeah, so again, daily life on a site during the offensive, it gives a, a very closer look uh, to all the soldiers who were there. Yeah, and, and just for those who are watching, that soldiers have been using spicy sauces for generations to improve the sometimes poor quality of army rations because your standard bully beef and, and, and spam and stuff not wasn't necessarily very appetizing. So I know all sorts of soldiers who had little bottles of of, of what we would call today piri piri fort sauce and hot sauce. They had it back in the First World War as well, Second World War. There's service people like Rob watching the history, but I'm sure he can tell us about the modern equivalents people take out to put in their ration to just take away the blandness. And as you say there, you, you were saying at the beginning about the, the almost perfect site in terms of having these different different types of soil to, to, to layer through. You're finding almost a perfect representation of different types of war. You know, you've got the 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 the, the Focke Wolf pilots coin there who died in a fiery inferno. And then you've got toasters and and just day-to-day -day living. It's it's all all those aspects of war you you seem to be finding in one, I was gonna say small space, but relatively small space. It's very interesting. As you mentioned, Paul, uh those were the thing. And Harry himself said in an interview that what they were reading wasn't <coughs> sorry was not enough and was not very good, actually. So it totally confirms that uh, they tried to enhance it any way they could. Brilliant stuff. 
Interesting here, as we know, Canadians use uh, British material uh, weapons, but uh, this one is uh, typically a Canadian uh, a spoon because there's a C on it. Uh, not every spoon was marked, but this one definitely was. So it's uh, another element that confirms that we knew that by the war diaries and the, the dig also, but these were Canadians on site. An interesting fact as well, from my experience, is you find way more spoons than you find knives or forks because the spoon is the only thing you absolutely need. You've, you've, had, you've got a jackknife, you've got a bayonet maybe, you can use a knife as a fork, but the one thing that you need is a spoon. So you'll find that a lot of soldiers, whether they're American, British, would throw away the fork or the knife. And the one thing, and I know people kept it in the in the chest pocket of their battle dress. So you've always got a spoon there to stir your tea, to use for stuff, to just... And so it, it, they seem to find that many more spoons than they do anything else because they were that much more universally used. And it's so clear. It's so true what you say, Paul, because uh, it's hard to eat soup uh, with the fork. So uh, you, you, you can eat anything with a knife apart from soup. <laughs> One has well, to be well, really, uh, army soup. If it's really, really, if it's so lumpy, probably can't, if you can eat soup with a knife, it's probably not good soup. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. It's a very skillful man. But uh, yeah, a spoon, I mean, it's uh, it's something. And, and that... Rob is saying it's called a racing spoon. You keep it in your pocket. So Rob is a moderner. Who, by the way, Rob is loving it. Rob, Rob is a serving uh, uh, Royal uh, uh, Artillery officer and is loving this show for the levels of details about artillery. So yeah, brilliant stuff, Then he's Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, another interesting find was uh, Denture. So I looked after this guy, and um, there's a serial number, uh, service number, sorry, on uh, the, the denture, uh, and it's a khaki one. So I wonder why a, a dentures would be khaki. Is it camouflage? Do you need to camouflage that? <laughs> if you need to camouflage the inside of your mouth, uh, that, yeah, but wow. So I'm not sure. So what happened is that I made some research. Uh, I was able to... Uh, confirmed that this uh, service number fra was from Le Régiment de Maisonneuve, who was on site. Uh, however, uh, and it's a sad part of the story, uh, when I contacted Library and Archives Canada, uh, they said that uh, some service files in the 60s and 70s were destroyed due to uh, private life uh, uh, reasons, something like that. So it's very likely that this man's file was destroyed and they told me but i i disagreed with them that this was a serial number but if it's a serial number uh why would it fit with le regiment maisonneuve who was on site we can a second battalion actually and so uh i found the only paper and it's in the book the only paper i found was from the 50s a uh, man who was in the reserve i i doubt but it would be the same man 10 years after especially with another non uh, NRMA number, but uh, yeah, so that's the situation now. So uh, my scientific explanation for that is that uh, the guy may have had a few beers, uh, maybe too many, and woke up the day after. But well, where's my dentures? And he had to go on. So it's still there, so you can claim it. So. <laughs> and stuff. Uh, I come back here to the. Um, prisoners of war and how ingenious the system were at the beginning. So they re-employed ammunition boxes to create a pipe with a, a basin here to um, handle uh, used waters or waste waters, whatever they were, and uh, they were drained in there and then uh, dealt with accordingly. But it was very interesting and uh, uh, to see how clever it was and how they had to adapt to the environment because at first, as I mentioned, camps were just a fence with people in it. Then there were like corrugated steel and stuff like that that were more elaborated. There are uh, some books that were published by French scholars in France about uh, German prisoners of war. Sorry, that uh, reached at one point one million prisoners. It's, it was huge. So it was in itself a huge endeavor to deal with that. So this shows uh, when you're on the ground and you see situations, how um, ingenious actually people can be. Uh, yeah, the poor civilians who were uh, who had to live in the quarries. Uh, uh, actually, when uh, D-Day began, they knew it was uh, the landing that was uh, long awaited, the liberation to come. But still, it took a while. Uh, 
to get to Caen uh, nearby, not uh, as Montgomery thought uh, we'll be in Caen on uh, June 6 on the evening. Very unlikely, so uh, that we can see why it didn't happen. But uh, yeah, it shows, uh, and they found everything of a daily life. People, uh, babies were born, so in some cases, uh, and people had uh, like tried to to have a normal life, a school, and but th this must have been. And uh, the witness I interviewed said that one thing we don't see in the picture is the, the stench or the odor that was yeah. prevailing in there. So the air obviously was stale, and uh, evacuation was really bad so when we think about that uh it, it uh, brings us lots of admiration for those people who live there uh for 50 days and, and plus yeah and one last uh, photo to show that coping with war can be in various ways like doing uh, cartoons and i found this uh, by a sixth field regiment gunner uh, alf O'Hanlon, who was from uh, battlefield uh battleford saskatchewan sorry uh, I think he died in 1989, I have to double check, but he left us some uh, examples of his uh, talent and it shows how they were able to cope with uh, with that the best they could on a daily basis. Brilliant stuff. So is there any more to the to the, um, the Harry's story to, to, to tie things up? Are you uh, still trying to work out who Rose is? Uh, yeah, well, uh, as we mentioned, uh, she might be a British sweetheart. We, at one point, we explored the idea that she might have been Canadian, but those bracelets, uh, who are, by the way, very common, uh, we found, yeah. uh, so many were found with prayers, messages, service numbers. Some were identified, but as I said, uh, this one was identified in context, which makes it a case study. So, Rose, it's, uh, it's very limited, so I thought about... Uh, contacting the BBC uh, to see if they're... It, it's a shot in the dark, but who knows? Uh, lots, Most of the, the soldiers were in Alden Short, uh, Aldershot, sorry, and uh, they met lots of, I mean, tons of people, so... But who knows? Who knows what could come out yeah, of that? And a lot, a lot of soldiers in Aldershot in World War II, as there still are. It's been a military town for, for hundreds of years. So, yeah, I mean, but, it, yeah, it's it's amazing to think that someone might know and someone might respond to a, to a BBC or even watching World War II TV or at some point see a website and, and connect the dots and, and, and put these stories together because, yeah, it would be great to find out who Rose is. We had a couple of questions, and then we will bring things to end. The first question is, well, the, the first one I want to ask you is about the strata around Con. Leslie is saying... Do these uh, stratas of rocks extend far across Caen? Because um, you know, you're talking about these kind of perfect conditions there. Is that is that typical for the area south and, and, and of Caen, or is it does it change? That I would have to ask a geologist because I, I'm not from around Caen, but uh, we would have to confirm with uh, specialists of the ground, like geologists, to see if it's uh, located in a specific area or if it's around. But I know there were lots of quarries. Yeah, no, definitely, and st still are in use. And um, so, um, I think well, we're, we're bringing things in. So, what, what, what next for you? I mean, obviously, for for you found about out about this project via the, the French diggers, and then you got involved in it. Um, do you have any more plans to come back and do stuff in Normandy? Because I mean, th th clearly there are more secrets the Earth could uncover here. Yeah, I would like to, and uh, there are some projects I would uh, eventually consider. But I'm, I started to work on a second book now, on uh, still on the 6th Field Regiment, mostly on the, the 63 men who never returned, and I will call it 63. But I will also work on those who came back. I was able to find over 100 of them uh, who were in uh, Harry's Regiment. It'll take a while, but I'm going slowly. But mostly, uh, like uh, last fall, I went to uh, bergen Zoom in the Netherlands. I took some uh, photos of the tombstones of uh, several gunners who uh, sadly rest there forever, but uh, they were from uh, the 6th Field Regiment. And uh, that's what I want to uh, try to bring them back to life, uh, to honor their memory, but also as we do in commemoration. But uh, whenever we talk about uh, someone who's, uh, who's gone, it's a way to keep him alive and basically uh, to keep his memory and uh, what he did. Uh, with us, basically. Um, and Brad from On This Day, Canadian Military History, is offering any any help you need with any more Canadian projects. He's offering his services there, so that that's nice to know. And uh, the other thing that we may have to save for another discussion is is the whole 
you know, amateur archaeology that goes mm -hmm. on. You know, we know we were talking before going live. There's hundreds of thousands of metal detectorists in France and across the world, and and people watching this have, have surveyed battlefields. I mean, I myself, I'm, you know, regularly you're just walking along and you find a bullet in the ground or something kings up or a bit of shrapnel and. You know, that's something that obviously is is going to happen. Uh, what you were doing with this was controlled, organized. You had the EOD people there. Everything's being recovered. But I, I'd love to bring you back at some point uh, in the future and discuss this this complicated subject. Uh, but if you want to kind of give a little summary of it now to kind of, where, you know, what, what's your basic feeling about it? Should leave it to the professionals or, or is it not as simple as that? It's a very delicate and sensitive issue because uh, I've heard both sides and officially uh, we need an authorization to uh, to dig uh, that can be obtained, I guess, from the uh, city hall, the town hall, sorry. But again, uh, the purpose of digging is not to find objects, it's to have objects that will tell us what happened. So through the object, we learn the past. And uh, I know that uh, there are cases where objects are dug up and uh, sold on some uh, platforms. Yeah. So it's uh, it's about awareness. It's about uh, making people aware of uh, how to do it and how important uh, the traces could be. Especially, I come back to the keyword context that if the layers are not destroyed you have the answers in, in waiting and they are pending. So these potential answers deserve to be found the, the right way. But it, again, it's a, it's a very sensitive issue because I show a documentary to my students in which you have people, for instance, in Peru who dig and say, we do it to feed our family because we don't have money. So then it's another scope. What do you do yeah. with that? So it, it raises a point that is interesting. And you cannot dis disregard or discard this point just because they did it. Because if it allows them to eat, well, uh, what would we do? So it's 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 an interesting question. Again, we have to be careful with uh, uh, unofficial uh, steps. No, I mean, I mean, in my twenty years in Normandy, I've been part of two or three archaeological projects in my time here. I've, I've heard of a few others. But unfortunately, they're not happening week in, week out. I mean, the 4,000 square miles of Normandy, while I've been here, relics below the ground are deteriorating all the time. Things being pulled up today in 2023 are likely to be in much poorer condition than they would have been pulled up 30 years ago. The museums that have stuff pulled up in the 50s and 60s, some of the, the weapons they were pulling up then, you could cock the bolt and take it out and put a bullet for it. Now you're pulling out you know, a piece of rust that crumbles in your hand. So... With all the will in the world, there's no way that professional archaeology could cover the entire battlefields of Europe. But at the same time, and I put up Gwilym's comment, comment here, all archaeology is destruction. However sensitively conducted, you can't do archaeology twice. So so it, it's a complicated subject. And you know, we were discussing before the show, folks, I hope to do a, show, a series probably two weeks next year called uh, Digging and Diving, where we look at the both the diving, uh, because I, if you remember, folks, we had Jen on a few months ago talking about the dive she did on Saipan, and she mm -hmm. gave me the contact deed. There's about a dozen different uh, marine archaeologists she knows around the world doing some amazing stuff, mostly in the clearer waters of the southern hemisphere than the northern waters, but some amazing people, and people like uh, like Denny here to, to talk about ground archaeology, because that would be a fascinating um uh, approach to understanding because i'm sure there's people watching this i said it earlier who who realized they're walking across a battlefield they learned things from that but you have learned so much more by going down those levels and it, and it, and actually pin uh, recording what you found that you know that that the, the the discolored earth where the jerry can cooker was um amazing stuff it's true and also a quick word on uh, the recognition of battlefield archaeology it's been recognized for years in Great Britain. You have the uh, University of Glasgow who offers program. You can do uh, a PhD there, especially with uh, famous uh, researchers who were there. In France, it began with uh, medieval archaeology. It went to the First World War. Then it was only in 2014 that the Second World War was officially integrated in research program. But in Canada, this has yet to be done. So that's why I'm doing this research here. Uh, very humbly to try to plant a seed that might grow and blossom and uh, raise some awareness because obviously we don't have all the answers with 
contemporary archaeology. That's what it's called. Yeah. But there are some answers which uh, who uh, that's already in their relationship with other fields. Obviously, history is the the the, the core thing. Uh, you have uh, toponymy, as we saw for names and other things. So whatever uh, field of specialty can be used to bring answers. Well, let's let's put it together and bring a, a wholesome and global answer, as we found for uh, the bracelet here. Yeah, I mean, it should be collaboration, shouldn't it? I mean, there's people who, like Rob, who's watching now, is a serving artillery officer. So if he had been with you on that dig, he would be able to give a particular unique bit of insight into how guns work up and distances. Yes, you would have the ammunition this distance away from the gun, and then his information would go in with the people who understand the soil and the people who understand what might go bang and the people who understand uh the the the, the details of 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 day-to-day -day life and it's all about bringing all these people together with the different the different levels of knowledge but we can i feel like we could be chatting for ages what we'll do is we'll book you and we'll, we'll we'll do another show about archaeology in the future so it's been absolutely fantastic so again folks this is the book we're talking about there is a link below but make if you if you're if those who are in canada make contact and um we'll work out when there can be copies available and when we have a link to it available on other uh, bookstores we will get that added but it's been fantastic talking to you sir and um and i can't wait to bring you back a future time tomorrow folks peter hart the, the incredible peter hart is back with his um colorful uh, exploits of of italia uh the drum light infantry in italy in 1944 and then we're back to other things on thursday hopefully steve will be back to talk about big red wine husky and friday arthur is on talking about the battle that you've been talking about today. We're going back to Operation Spring and the battles for Tilly La Campania, which will be fantastic on Friday. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, Denis. Thanks, viewers. Thank I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye.